So out here in the Western theater of the war, the Navy's river fleet is absolutely vital to the Union strategy. We're here at the USS Cairo, constructed in 1861. It struck a torpedo in 1862. In 1964, it was raised and now is partially reconstructed, as you can see today. She's designed from the keel up as a steam-powered low-draft vessel, eight in her class. They're named for cities along the, Missis uh, the Mississippi. This is the Cairo, which you might refer to as Cairo if you see it, but it's pronounced Cairo. Now we're going to discuss the Brownwater Fleet and its role in the Western Theater in the Civil War. Why were boats like this constructed for the River Fleet? You, well, if you know how these rivers flow through the center of the country, the, the level rises throughout the year with the seasons. And the seagoing navy, the blue water navy, are drafted much deeper with uh, sharper keels. The brown water navy is, is not quite a flat boat, like a bass boat, but they're built with a, with a uh, flatter hull so that they can deal with that rising and flowing and still maneuver. The seagoing vessels that are steam powered, their paddles are on the sides and they dig deep into the water. These vessels are built, like most river boats, with a rear wheel so it drafts, or rather it hits the water behind and doesn't dig as deep because if the water is low, these can still function. And you can see all the way down to the keel here, this is a pretty shallow draft yes, vessel. Yes, and, and very much uh, more flat than the seagoing vessels that have that angled hull to them. These are also built from the keel up as steam-powered vessels. Most of the capital ships in the Navy at that point, the frigates like, uh, like Wabash and Constitution, the ones that fight against the uh, CSS Virginia, they are sailing vessels that have steam plants added for that extra propulsion at sea, whereas there's nothing else powers these because you're on the river. You can't rely on sail to push against the strong currents. They're going to need that, that torque from the steam, the steam plant that move both directions. And now I see it's no HMS Warrior, but I do hmm. see iron plating yes. already on a vessel constructed in 1861. Right. The technology is new to the U.S. Navy, and like the ordnance heads are, are reluctant to add incorporate repeating rifles and faster weapons the Navy's reluctant to go to this because they see the added weight and they, they see that as a, as a detriment to maneuverability but it's extremely vital because of the slow movement on the river they're going to be targets for a long time even as they move that they need that protection on them so the two inch plating can't be manufactured except in a flat way when it when it's cast so the adaptation of railroad rail, those strips, those are railroad rail that are, that are used in that manner where they're heated and curved around, and they serve the same purpose. They'll deflect small arms fire for sure and indirect artillery fire. She's got guns all about her. She's, she would have sloping two-inch armor on the sides. Her, her pilot house is also armored. Those tall wooden areas represent where the stacks would be. She sank in 1862. She hit what we call a mine. But at the time of the war, a mine in the water was referred to as a torpedo. So you may have heard of Flag Officer Farragut saying, damn the torpedoes. He's talking about the uh, mines that are floating in the channel at Mobile Bay. But there are, there are torpedoes out in the river here, and the river fleet comes, and she hits one of them. She sinks into the mud in 1862, and she scuttled, and her crew gets away, her Marines and her sailors. She had Marines aboard, yes, as small as she is. And... It's, uh, it's 102 years later that the mud is found to have preserved and she's drawn out and restored to some respects and her original, uh, her original hull is somewhat preserved. Now the Cairo is one of eight in the river fleet constructed yes. specifically for the purpose of operating on the river, right? Right. The strategy that the War Department and the Navy start to develop because of Farragut and Porter and Foote, uh, the flag officers that have the most influence, they're, and, and, uh, they're looking at the need to provide that security on the rivers. The rivers, the rivers are we're we're going after the river areas because of the the forts and the commerce. And that they'll need to flow. take on those forts. Yes, and the navy is confident that they can do it themselves. So the 1862 naval campaign to invest Vicksburg tries to prove that by bringing deep water vessels from New Orleans upriver and then building these and bringing them down river. And the Navy is confident they're going to do that. And they find you can only do so much with these ships because you still need troops to go ashore. And this is where the doctrine of combined arms comes in mind because in the East, the Army views the Navy as water taxi. Get us to where we are, troop transports. And McClellan's strategies all deal with, I can move my troops fast on the, on the river and get them ashore. And the thank you Navy, go, to, go, go out to sea again and we'll do things fine. Whereas 
We're looking at how many guns do you see aboard that ship that can supplement the land artillery because we're operating offshore. So it's, it's an amphibious warfare doctrine that's being developed as well. And you need the cooperation between the naval officers and, and the army officers to do that. Yeah, expand on that, because I mean, that's, that's one theme that we've discussed quite a lot is that in the Western theater, there absolutely needs to be combined arms there, and there needs to be cooperation, cooperation between yeah. the officers and those egos there. Right, and in the East, the officers, the deep water Navy officers that assume control of this brown water fleet, their previous experience to this point has been the Army just doesn't understand or, or appreciate what we can do along with them. So the Army officers have this air of, you're just our, our you're, you're driving the wagons on the ocean for us and we don't need you then. So they feel underused, where when I come to work with them, I'm seeing them as equals and sometimes superiors because legitimately these officers never stop serving. So if we count stripes, they're, they've been in service much longer. And that works to assuage their, their suspicions of air, this air of superiority that because I've, I've humbled myself to them, they're more than ready to, to work and willing to, to submit to my desire or my uh, strategic needs that they even say, you tell me where you want me and I'll support you. And that's, that is an incredible gift in the overall scheme of designing strategy here that that is a key factor in my planning that I can treat that as another wing of my forces and not an, a navy wing or an army wing but an overall combination of what's available and so henry donaldson shiloh and now at vicksburg yeah. the navy is not just a, a supplement but an, a vital part an integral of part. the campaign you can say well the army's the na the uh, infantry the cavalry the artillery what have you well let's add we have the waterborne support to that that's another element of the entire force that's available so what does the Navy actually do here at Vicksburg? In the efforts to get the uh, transports downriver, they aid us with uh, getting past with not just this canal debacle that falls apart, but they allow our, our troops to move. They become our water taxi, but that's not the end of it because below here at Fort Gibson, Grand Gulf area, where they're infesting those, those shore assets the Army, that the Confederates have, they're providing artillery support to us. And we drop off and we wave goodbye and head inland to Jackson, but they're still out here. They're still out here providing harassing fire and they're probing for ways from the water that they can support. And once we lay siege to, to uh, Vicksburg, they become a waterborne artillery asset for uh, the artillery that's coming from our siege line. They're also sending it from this side. So it's a constant reminder. And what the Vicksburg garrison may have hoped for was once we run below and we're inland, they're free to navigate the river. And the Navy never lets, control, lets go of that control. And those that like to refer to the Anaconda Plan, they see that the, the snake has been along the coast of you know, the Atlantic Ocean and around into the Gulf. Well, now the snake has also spread up the Mississippi, so it's almost truly choking off the entire uh, being of the Confederacy on all sides. Well, that was the Cairo and the Navy's role in the Western Theater. Thanks for joining us and discussing how the Navy is key to why the war was won in the West.